Welcome everyone to this fourth installment of the Eden uh, series autumn webinars uh, in time of a uh, new normal. Uh, we are uh, here today, uh, on the 5th of October, International Teachers' Day. Uh, and uh, for this uh, reason, I salute all of you. Uh, us teachers have uh, been in, uh, in the front lines uh, of uh, these times and we have the possibility to, to be leaders uh, for our communities. It is very important uh, that we remember this uh, when we plan our work. Uh, please uh, write uh, your uh, name and present yourself and uh, the place where you are coming from uh, in the chat area. Remember and uh, dur during this webinar, if uh, you have uh, any questions for our speakers, please uh, write them in the Q&A section. For those of you who are watching us uh, via YouTube, uh, rest assured when you are going to write your question, uh, our uh, colleagues are going to, uh, to transmit those questions to us and we are going to answer uh, them live here in, uh, in Zoom. But for people in Zoom, please use the Q&A for, for the uh, questions you want to ask. We have people from uh, all over the world. I see people from uh, the US, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, so I'm very happy that uh, we have a very uh, large uh, and international audience. As I said, uh, today is International Teachers' Day. Uh, in these times, uh, many of the uh, programs and uh, efforts that were being put in place uh, were for students. And sometimes teachers uh, were a little bit neglected, even if tools were provided uh, support and uh, training, proper training lacked for uh, many teachers. Uh, so even if they are very good at their profession, uh, they find it difficult to teach online in an effective way. That's why it's very important that uh, we are going to talk today about uh, how to uh, get support for these teachers, for all those teachers uh, through communities. And I think it's a very interesting topic and I'm very happy and honored to moderate this. Uh, I'm Vlad Mihaescu. I'm the steering chair committee of uh, steering committee chair, sorry, of the uh, NAP of the Eden Network of Academic Professionals, uh, and uh, I'm coming from uh, Polytechnica University of Timisoara in Romania. Uh, I have today, uh, besides me, three very uh, involved uh, and dedicated uh, ladies who are. Uh, uh, game changers in, uh, in what they are doing in regards to uh, building communities to support teachers. So I'm going to uh, present who the speakers of uh, today's uh, webinar session uh, are. So first, uh, Maha Bali, Associate Professor of Practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo, Egypt. And then we have uh, Autumn Keynes, Instructional Designer at the University of Michigan, Dearborn in the USA. And last but not least, we have Mia Zamora, who is an Associate Professor of English and the Director of the Masters in Writing Studies and Director of the Keene University Writing Project in Union, New Jersey, USA. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, uh, briefly the first speaker for today's uh, session. Uh, and this is uh, Maha Bali, as I said, uh, coming from uh, Cairo in Egypt. She is an associate professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. She has a PhD in education from the University of Sheffield in the UK, co-founder of virtuallyconnecting.org and co-facilitator of Equity Unbound. Uh, she writes and speaks frequently about social justice, critical pedagogy and open and online education. I saw some of her presentations and I'm very, very uh, eager to hear her now. Maha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vlad, and thank you everyone for being here. It's so good to be with you all. I was asking a question in the chat, how are you feeling today? Because I think in this pandemic, it's really important to check in with people. It's really hard for a lot of people. Some days are up, some days are down. I hope this becomes a, you know, a fun moment in your day because we get kind of Zoom fatigued all day. So I hope today turns out to be one of the, the good hours of your day. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is a particular community building resource uh, that we worked on. Um, Autumn, Mia and I, and also a lot of the people who are in the chat participated as well, Irene from Kenya and Catherine Cronin from Ireland. Uh, and basically what happened is I'm a faculty developer, so my job is to help other professors to teach uh, 
in general, but of course, during the pandemic, how to teach online. And, you know, you give them all the basic guidance and then you start to realize uh, a lot of them are saying, well, in building community online is hard. I, I think it's not possible. So I'm just going to skip it while we're teaching online. And I'm like, no, it's possible. Those of us who have experience with it know that it's very possible. And they think, oh, I can develop student relationship between me and the students, but I can't get the students to do it. And, you know, with this pandemic where there's this physical distancing and students are missing the social social aspect and the socio-emotional aspect more than usual, it feels like this is even more important to emphasize, right? And so I was feeling that and hearing this feedback in my own university. And then Autumn and I were in a virtually connecting session. She will explain what that is. And people were talking about that too. And we're like, uh, well, wait a minute, maybe we should sort of develop resources to help people with that. And what we decided to do is People won't, when you tell them, do it, if they don't see it happening in practice, they can't imagine it. And so we decided to create this resource and we collaborated between virtually connecting Equity Unbound, which Mia will talk about, and uh, 1HE, which is uh, just an organization that is about connecting global educators to improve education in general. And we came up with this resource, which someone will type in the chat, I am sure. And I will share my screen. And I, I just want to ask people who are in the room, has anyone seen this resource before or when you signed up for this webinar? Uh, if you have used it before, tell us if you've used any of the resources on it. Because that would be interesting to see and, and share as well. So it's a, it's a site. And on it, we, what we decided to do is we would meet and try an activity together and record the video and also provide text to describe how would you prepare for it, additional resources like slides or links and uh, adaptations. If you have to be asynchronous, how would you do it? If your students don't have their video on, how would you do it? If you have students who are particularly shy, how would you do it? Things like that. I'm gonna check the chat to see if someone yes. has used it. Thank you, Anna Christina. All right, I would love to hear about particular activities you've used and maybe I can, uh, I can actually show them as well. So what, where, after we started doing them, we're like, oh, wait a minute, how are people gonna find, like they're now more than 30 resources, how are you gonna find the one you need, right? So we're like, oh, well, maybe we need to split them up into introductory activities, things for ongoing engagement, tips for warming up at the beginning of class, and um, setting the tone. So for example, uh, there's one about annotating your syllabus. I don't know if you guys know Rami Kalir uh, from University of Colorado, Denver. And he talked about how you can make your, your syllabus into like a Google Doc or even a PDF that people can annotate and ask your students to not only give you feedback on the syllabus at the beginning of the semester, but also in the middle and end of semester. So it's a way to not only invite your students to read your syllabus, because like how often do students actually read the syllabus, but it also gives them an opportunity to feel like they can actually question certain aspects of it and show you which aspects of it are not clear. And it's, a, it's very simple how you can go through it. And Remy explains that in the video and gives you examples. Um, another type of activity is to write an open letter or video to your students. This one, I was actually just inspired by someone on Twitter who did one. And I was like, it makes a huge difference to just set the tone that you, know, you wanna tell your students how the class is gonna be. And then there are some introductory activities, like for example, this surrealist free drawing where students kind of draw each other. This was an activity proposed by Autumn, and my daughter participated in the activity. And one of the funny things that happened is that Mia's son and my daughter show up in a lot of the videos. And we were, at first we were like, should we edit this out? And then we we're like, you know what, this is how we are. And we discovered that a lot of people like this because they feel like we're more human, just as they are human, just as many of us have our children show up in videos and pets and all these kinds of things. So it makes it okay that we do that. Um, and then there are other things that are ongoing types of things that you want to do, like just having a third place for community building, like a WhatsApp or a Slack channel or something like that. Um, and so we're talking about this one as well. And there's a, there's a group of activities called Liberating Structures. Is anyone here familiar with the Liberating Structures? You know what they are? I can put the website for that. Can someone put the website? It's just liberatingstructures.com. Um, and these are activities that in face-to-face -face are great, but also online are cool uh, to sort of structure conversations in small groups so that they're equitable and they produce a lot of really interesting outcomes in a very short amount of time. And what happens when you do them um, online is that this suddenly, the thing that you can't do with small groups, and suddenly you know what to do with the small groups so that the students don't get lost to people in the breakout rooms. 
Um, and the thing is that in the past, you had text descriptions of them, but you couldn't see them in practice, so you couldn't imagine them. So the videos have been really helpful to create. So Troika Consulting, for example, is one where students give, so you can have students give support to each other when they're, um, when they're, uh, they're, they're new to online learning. So what kind of problems are you struggling with with online learning? Let's help each other. And the, the teacher doesn't have to do it. So it's really cool to, to have that. And then there was some really useful stuff that came out of, while we were developing these resources, we invited people to give us feedback and to suggest more resources. So some people contacted me, they're like, oh, I have something to contribute and we filmed something with them. And then there are others where someone said, oh, by the way, this could be problematic. And so Kate Bowles is one person who wrote for us some safety considerations when we're doing introductory activities that could hurt someone's feelings or be sensitive to someone who has a very special fragile situation. And so we think this is also important. Um, and for example, Mace I met filmed one with me about asking students about how is your heart and recognizing that we're all going through trauma right now and some of us are more sensitive and vulnerable than others um, and talking about that. So for me, this resource is to provide support for teachers so that they can be better and feel more confident when they go back to their students. Uh, so for me, like you're giving care to teachers so that they can care for their students. And I'm happy to give up the rest of my time for someone else if I still have time, so. You still have time. I still have time, it's fine. Let me take, Let me read through the chat because I wanted to know if people have used it, which particular ones they've used. Oh, that's so great, Sharon, to hear that. I, I've been hearing people are including it in their resource collections. So that's really, really good to hear. If people have tried particular ones, there's one that I've heard a lot of people liked. It was a story of your name. Ask your students to share the story of their name, where it came from. You can choose whichever of their names. Uh, and people really like that one. But also at the same time, it's a safety. You have to be careful that maybe someone is very sensitive. They have a name change for some reason. Uh, for trans people who may not be ready on the first day of class to trust people with sharing their identity, for example. So it's really, um, it's, it's very interesting how sometimes some of the best activities can also be very sensitive for certain students. And I don't know if anyone has experience with that. Uh, and then some activities is, are really cool in the sense that they require you to use pen and paper. And it's very interesting when you're online to do something physical or one of the videos is about doing meditation together, you know. Uh, and there's other ones that are not published yet. They're about using theater of the oppressed, something called image theater, where you move your bodies to try to create a portrait in the classroom. Uh, so things that usually when you're online, you're just sitting like this and you're tense and you're smiling all the time. And then and that's, that's not a very comfortable pose and it's not very realistic to, to spend your whole life this like everybody's shoulders and necks like you need to stretch because I've been sitting a lot today so you know <laughs> reminding people to do that kind of thing as well <laughs> it's good to see so many friends and I'm going to stop here um, and if people have questions they want me to answer I'll try to do that thank you uh, Maha this was very uh, interesting and uh, instructive. I'm sure that uh, people who didn't knew about didn't know about this uh, uh, platform, this community, are going to, to start and uh, take a look on it and use it. Uh, I think we all agree we live uh, stressful times as teachers, and uh, these uh, support communities uh, come very, very good, very in hand now uh, nowadays. Uh, I'm going to uh, move on to our uh, second speaker uh, of, uh, of this session, and uh, this is uh, Autumn Keynes. Uh, she is an instructional designer at the University of Michigan, the Horn, in the Hub for Teaching and Learning Resources, prior to which she held professional appointments at St. Norbert College and Capital University. She holds a master's degree in educational technology from the Ohio State University, in the open, she is a co-director of Virtually Connecting, where her work explores questions of presence and spontaneity in synchronous virtual conversations, as well as equity and inclusion in online communities. She also helps organize and facilitate open connected online events for the purposes of faculty development and her own, own practice in digital stewardship. So please, Autumn, the floor is yours and continue with this wonderful discussion about uh, the communities. Thanks so much, Vlad. Um, 
Hi, everybody. My name is Autumn Keynes. As Vlad just said, uh, I'm an instructional designer at the University of Michigan Dearborn, but I do a lot of work in the open um, in different communities. Um, and one of my most beloved online communities is um, the uh, Virtually Connecting group. And I'd like to talk to you about a little bit of the um, foundations, the start, the history of that community, as well as um, uh, this idea of intentionally equitable hospitality that was born out of it, which um, we're now seeing those of us who are very close to that um, are seeing that we're incorporating that into other communities that we're a part of as well. So um, is it okay if I share my screen? I, it says that I can't share my screen while another participant is sharing. So can we... Uh, take down what we have up right now and then move that over so that I can share. While we're getting that started, I will just go ahead and maybe give you a little bit of uh, the history of virtually connecting. Here we go. I think I can share this one. I think I've got the Liberating Structures uh, <laughs> website up right now, but I think I have this in another tab here. We can close this over. There we go. Here we go. This is virtually connecting. Um, and virtually connecting actually started uh, in around 2015 when Meha couldn't make it uh, to a conference that she had been really involved in. Um, so she sat on the board. She had several presentations that were accepted and um, was very, very involved in this conference. And then at the last minute, because of all, you know, I mean, she lives in Cairo. The, con the conference was in the United States. There were a lot of logistics that had to go on to make it happen, and it wasn't going to happen. There was just too many other things going on. And our other colleague, Rebecca Hogue, said, well, I'm actually going to that conference. How about if I brought you there? I have a phone. We have Google Hangout at the time was what we used. And uh, you can sign in and I'll take you around to the conference. Uh, not so much for the sessions. Meha was actually working with the, um, the conference organizers to have them bring her into the sessions that she was supposed to present in. But she was like, you know, I'm gonna miss out on the community aspect. I'm gonna miss out on those hallway conversations, having coffee with people, bumping into people that you've only known in those online spaces. Um, and so that's how Virtually Connecting was sort of born. But um, as that, you know, event happened and was successful, there was um, this idea, could we do this on a larger scale? Because there's all kinds of equity problems with conferences. When we talk about uh, faculty communities of support or faculty development communities, conferences are a huge place where that happens. We gather together at these conferences to um, learn from one another, to present on the things that we've been working on and the thinking that we've been doing. And so, um, Communities come out of that, and quite often those even spill over into subject areas or they spill over into these SIGs or uh, listservs or things like that. But the actual ability to go to the conference itself is incredibly um, resource intensive. It takes a lot of money. Registration fees are very, very um, expensive. The travel is expensive. Lodging is expensive. So uh, we continued for a couple of years organizing little hallway conversation events um, at these physical conferences where we would uh, advertise that we were going to be having these conversations and um, invite people who couldn't come to these events for whatever reason um, to be a part of the conversation with us. And we found that there were a lot of folks who maybe had other obligations. Maybe they were parents or they had, um, uh, they had, um, 
parents themselves that they were caring for, you know, they were a caregiver of some kind. And so leaving to go to another state or another country or another province or something like that, it just really wasn't in the cards for them. Um, they couldn't afford to. Maybe they're graduate students, things like that. And so we were able to bring in to the conference voices um, and build what I like to think of as really a hybrid community. So we like to think about faculty learning communities, support communities as either these face-to-face -face things that happen out of our centers for teaching and learning or um, things that happen in conferences or now especially things that are happening online. But what was really interesting, I think, about virtually connecting is that it's a hybrid, right? We're taking something that's happening in a face-to-face -face environment that's very locally um, centered and um, we're inviting people from all over the globe to come and be a part of that. What is particularly interesting about that environment is that um, the power dynamics that are involved are all over the place. So we are inviting people who are at the conference who are presenting, sometimes even keynote speakers or organizers of the conference who have a lot of social capital, who have a lot of, um, uh, you know, um, social abilities inside of these spaces who often have a lot of resources because they're maybe further on in their career and they just have more money um, to, to be able to uh, be in these spaces together uh, with people who can't, right? And so with these power dynamics being all over the place, we're trying to juggle and make sure that we're being hospitable to everybody in the room. Um, that's a tricky space to be in. And we heard a lot about the type of hospitality that we were giving in these spaces, which I'll say is messy. These are messy spaces. When we start talking about how we ensure that somebody feels welcome in a space, I think it's really hard to make sure that somebody feels welcome in a space. I think the best that we can do is offer and try to, um, you know, do simple things like learning names and, uh, <laughs> you know, learning who people are, spending time to listen to them. But we can never guarantee that somebody's going to feel welcomed. What we can do is offer our hospitality to them. I think um, when we start trying to guarantee hospitality then we get into some trouble. So here in the United States, anyway, the hospitality industry is something that is um, that, that I've had experience with. So when I was younger, that was something that was offered to me as maybe a career path. I didn't end up taking that career path, but very much has a mentality of the customer is always right. And there's a certain etiquette and a certain protocol to hospitality. Um, that you have to run through. And if you do that, then you've done your hospitality work, right? Um, and we really rejected that. We did not want to think of hospitality as something that was a protocol or something that was an etiquette or something that you would do a checkbox that everything would work out. Because really each person who comes to a different environment, be those social groups, be those virtual environments, be those physical environments, that person brings their unique experience to that space. And without making time to uh, recognize that and um, try to approach that from an equitable standpoint, um, we think that you will, you know, we found that you would run into some troubles. And so through years of doing this virtually connecting, we, a bunch of us who did it on a pretty regular basis, got together to uh, write this article called um, Intentionally Equitable Hospitality and Hybrid Video Dialogue, the Context of Virtually Connecting. And um, I can pop that into the chat really quickly. Um, oh, somebody else already did. Perfect. Matt, thank you. <laughs> um, and what we're doing here is really making the point to pay attention to who is in the room, making a point of uh, 
realizing who um, has the power and who has most voice in other spaces um, and giving an opportunity for those who don't have such a uh, um, an opportunity to hear, have their voices heard, giving them a space where they can do that and giving them a space where we are going to listen to them and receive that um, in a welcoming way. And again, I don't think that you can force uh, somebody to feel welcome right? <laughs> you need to feel welcome now. I did these five things. That that part is not going to really work. But I do think that um, hospitality comes more naturally and comes more organically when you uh, do think about things from a space of equity and you try to give voice to those who um, quite often don't get a chance to uh, to speak and to be heard. So if it's okay, Vlad, I don't know where we're at with timing, but I wouldn't mind uh, maybe stopping there and turning things over to Mia to talk about how this then gets applied in um, some other contexts. Thank you, Autumn. Um, I just want to say I feel very welcome in this uh, uh, webinar. So uh, that means uh, all of you are doing a very good job and I'm sure the rest of the participants are uh, feeling welcome. Um, as uh, Ethan uh, uh, has uh, shown in the past weeks, we, we are uh, presenting different uh, topics each week. And uh, I think this topic of uh, support for teachers is a very important one. That's why I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, speaker. And uh, this is Mia Zamora. She is an associate professor of English, the director of the master's program in writing studies, and the director of the Keene University Writing Project in Union, New Jersey, USA. She has recently received the Keene University Professor of the Year Award. Uh, her commitment to equity, digital literacy, data rights, and intercultural understanding is clear in both her scholarship and leadership work. She has founded several global learning networks, including Equity Unbound and Network Narratives, and was co-chair of uh, Alt's uh, OER 20 conference on care in openness. Mia, please, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Vlad. And um, I just want to say thank you to my two colleagues for sort of setting up our conversation. I have a feeling we'll have a really robust and interesting um, q and I also think it's quite serendipitous that it's a special day today, a day for celebrating teaching and um, you know, thinking about our practice together is the best way to celebrate that. Um, and um, I figured I'd uh, take my little bit of time to share um, another angle of the same story in a way. So Autumn was just talking about intentional, equitable hospitality and how difficult it is to sort of um, hit that note quite right. Um, and so what I'd like to do is start um, with just telling you a bit of a story about uh, the network um, Equity Unbound, how it was founded and what kind of work we've done and how that sort of led to the projects um, that were featured here today, in particular, um, the community building resources that Maha shared out. So I'm going to share my screen now and just um, simply um, take us to the uh, front of the, excuse me, the. Um, front of the, uh, sorry, I'm just getting the right window open, here we go. The front of the um, Equity Unbound website. And I'm sure one of my colleagues will th throw in um, the link to Equity Unbound overall into the chat. But I wanted to explain to all of you what Equity Unbound is, first of all. Um, it's a network, it's a community, it's friends, it's um, co-learners, it's collaborators coming together online to do specific kinds of work, work that is equity focused, it's open, it's connected, and it focuses on intercultural learning experiences across classes, across countries, across contexts. Um, the, the founding story goes a little bit like this. Um, it was the end of my own sabbatical experience at the University of Bergen in Norway. And I was getting ready to return home from the wonderful Norway to the conflict fraught uh, US um, with a bit of anxiety and had a nice 
call and conversation with two colleagues um, that I admire very much, Maha and Catherine Cronin, who happens to be um, with us today in the, um, in the, in the webinar here. And um, we spoke about how to move the kind of work that we feel most convicted about, most strongly about, most passionate about, which is this idea of equity and also intercultural understanding. How can we move that forward in any productive way? And we came up with the idea that maybe we just um, think about some of the um, productive activities that we do online and um, find ways to do them across um, across seas and across cultures in a way that also opens up possibilities for others who are out there that might be interested in coming all along on that ride. So um, the three of us founded Equity Unbound. And since then, we've had several iterations of this work over time. You know, it's, it's going into the third year now. And um, we have many other um, uh, participants, contributors, and some people dip into the work simply for one particular activity that works within their classroom context that they feel really matches up beautifully what they're trying to do in their own um, curriculum. And then other times there are people who are paired up throughout the majority of a course. So there's um, you know, uh, several activities that we do collaboratively in some way. Um, sometimes we have things called studio visits where we invite other scholars, other colleagues to come in and have timely conversations about issues we're all grappling with um, together. And we have a lot of asynchronous activity online. All of this, by the way, done mostly on the um, social media site of Twitter. We have a handle there and we have a hashtag, et cetera. So we're exploring digital literacies, equity, intercultural learning focus in an open and connected way online. That's the work of Equity Unbound. Um, and so um, that's, our, that's our origin story. We're just, we're continuing to grow and we're even um, moving into um, what we feel is at the heart of our work as well. Um, just a quick mention of our current project, which is imagining a socially just academia. Um, and we're launching a particular project this coming week on, I mean, this Friday, it's um, a webinar that all of you are invited to if you're at all interested in these issues, but um, it's an open network long-term project, which will be a series of listening sessions, conversations, workshops, um, and we're going to work on dismantling oppression and promoting decolonial and anti-racist practices in academic institutions, research practice, our curricula, and our teaching practices. Um, this is, of course, a huge and ambitious project, um, which is under the umbrella of our general um, uh, 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 equity unbound work. Um, but all of it is side by side in many ways, in part because in essence, sorry, wrong window, in part because all this work is prongs of the same thing. It's prongs of the same values that we work together on. So um, now I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit and just talk to you uh, just a brief bit more about pedagogies of care and the theory of care behind our overall work. Um, we, th we think together all the time about what it means to um, work in the open in a way that invites and makes everyone feel um, as comfortable as possible. Um, also being extremely self-reflective about the limits of that work or the constraints around that work. So a couple of things I just values that I wanted to um, kind of extend a little bit or, or foreground here. Um, one of the things I think is key or a cornerstone of, of what we do is thinking about ourselves as co-learners. Um, much of our work in um, in university and higher ed is about professionalizing, gaining degrees, gaining expertise, gaining mastery. And along the way, we, um, we assume and um, take on a certain forms of authority because we've worked hard to get there. And yet at the same time, we are also mentoring and bringing along all the time young learners who will one day 
also have a little bit more of a kind of platform to stand on, to share ideas and to share work. And inherently in that sort of progression and hierarchy of academic work, there is this sense of, well, just that, like a hierarchy and an issue of power, right? Um, you know, the teacher knows better and the students listen quietly and perhaps passively at whatever content they need to master. Um, but we're interested in a more complex environment for learning than that um, kind of staid and static um, uh, context, one that has in many ways um, extended a, a certain forms of injustice for, for a very long time. So co-learning, that is to sit side by side with your students as equals, on a kind of journey that you're designing together is not an easy move to make as, as a professor, but that's precisely what we're trying, or as a teacher. And that's, but that's precisely the space that we're trying to sort of work in and think about and extend in many ways. Um, so uh, the, the 1HE uh, community building resources is in many ways a showcase of some of the infrastructure Structural and uh, teaching moves that we make. Um, we think about uh, like kind of gestures and moves and strategies to produce a co-learning environment. 1HE in many ways is a tribute to that idea of co-learning. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about collaborative design. That is, sometimes when we go about planning our teaching to um, teaching that will roll out for our students, we're sort of um, master designers, sort of work working in um, behind the scenes and understanding quite um, all the like threads and machinations of what we want to roll out. Um, Co-designing in collaboration, it's an extension of co-learning in some ways, is also a hard space to work in, but one that we're constantly thinking about. Um, basically, I guess in digital speak, that might be things like crowdsourcing, having third spaces for um, everyone who's involved with learning to, to um, speak both synchronously, but also asynchronously about the work. But also, I think it's very important to bring your students' voices into whatever production is ongoing in the course. In online learning in particular, I think we have a lot of opportunity. As an example of what I mean, um, just one simple example is that I syndicate all of the blog posts of my students into the course websites that I design for my courses because I want the students to have a kind of flow of community conversation that's ever present so that the course website isn't something the professor has made for them as much as it's something we're always making together. So that notion of collaboration as an important value is something I wanted to bring to the foreground today. I also want to sit, um, briefly talk about um, metacognition. Um, what does that mean? It means a little bit that what you practice is also what you're theorizing in a way. And we do this often um, as colleagues. Um, and it, it's, it's a sort of a fun thing. Even when we're planning out things together and our planning workshops, we're also working through the liberating structure paradigms that we're actually modeling. So it's this meta experience of being reflected at the same time that we're taking something into action and sharing it and modeling it at the same time. So that instinct is really important, I think, in the work we do. Um, finally, I guess the last thing I want to emphasize, and then we'll close it out and have a Q&A in a, in a short bit. But the last thing I wanna talk about is the importance of creativity. In, in teaching and learning. Inviting your students to do fun things, to be playful. Um, in the community building resources, there's a few um, activities we could highlight. And one that I'm thinking of just off the top of my head right now that would fall into a creative um, space is something like the surrealist self-portraits. And I think Autumn and Maha and Hoda, who is Maha's daughter um, did showcase that work. But in essence, it's trying to do a self-portrait with the um, non-dominant hand. So um, if you're right-handed, then to draw yourself 
in one minute with your left hand, etc. But this becomes a kind of way to introduce yourself to others by explaining what happened and what you were trying to capture, etc. But that's a very creative way to open up a sense of connection in your classroom, rather than saying, I'm a um, computer science major with interest in writing, and I'm a third year student at the American University of Cairo. That's another way to introduce a student, an introduce, a, a student to introduce themselves, but it might not have the same kind of impact in getting to know someone as um, having a playful assignment and then a discussion, a quick round robin discussion in, in how that went. Um, you remember a lot more about a person when you have these kinds of creative moments inserted into your classrooms. So creativity is important. And I want to say that I think at the heart of creativity is something even more powerful. Um, the, the formal word for it is epiphania. Uh, that's a, you know, throw out a essay an SAT word. Epiphania is when you make these connections that are not necessarily um, in any way related, but you see something that's disparate, but you understand in some way how it's connected together. And so I think a lot of what we do in our connected learning work is to sort of expand that notion of epiphania in powerful ways, to make connections that are not apparent, but in some ways move our work, move our intentions, move our sense of empowerment forward in beautiful ways. So I just wanted to end um, my, my comments with, those are some of the values that we take into this work as a team, as a network, uh, um, as a community. Um, and uh, one, the global 1HE resources that are for community building are built in that spirit, virtually connecting as a professional um, uh, uh, a professional organization that's connecting people on varying hierarchical scales, you know, in terms of their professional development. It brings people together for meaningful, empowered conversations. And then, of course, Equity and Bound, which reaches towards um, curricular activities and and co and uh, co-learning in an intercultural environment in the open web, but also is doing activist work to expand um, our sense of what it means to teach and learn to um, perspectives that are not necessarily listened to um, in the past, um, have been marginalized, have been pushed aside. So in a way, there's that's, that's an activist wing that we're pursuing there. Um, all of this stuff that we mentioned today is all bound together in a nice um, sort of um, environment or milieu that we're, we're deeply and truly excited to share with you. And hopefully now we can talk about it more through question and answers. Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I just I just want to say that Nikki Spalding has joined us and Nikki is our 1HE Excellent. partner. He, we send her stuff and then she makes it happen on the website and she organizes it and she makes it perfect. Uh, so welcome, Nikki, and thank you so much for your work on this. Hi, Nikki, and, and talk about um, beautiful design. Nikki's got that down. <laughs> thank you, Mia. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, kindly ask uh, participants to write down their questions in the Q&A section for uh, our speakers. I love that you uh, emphasized in the end on cre creativity. And uh, I think this is very important uh, nowadays because uh, many teachers uh, are not they not, not they don't know how to be more creative on the online. It's not that they don't want to. And how 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 can we get more creative if we are only alone? So we need this collaboration. We need these networks so that we can get another perspective. And uh, getting another perspective helps us uh, become more creative. Uh, I have uh, one question uh, from the YouTube channel uh, from Marco Schneider, and uh, he asks uh, about uh, the one he He says. It seems you need to log in uh, to access the resource. Maybe it is not open. Maybe, uh, Maha, if you can. Uh, uh, Which resource this one. is not open? The equity, the 1HE? It's open. Uh, they, they, guessing... they might have put they might have put www. Just let them take the 1HE global.org slash equity and bound. That should work. Okay. It's open. So our, our Someone colleagues... could copy it and paste it in the YouTube. Um, and let, let me just share my screen quickly so they can see the URL at the top. You see this one over here? So there's no www. I think sometimes people put a www and that will give them a login screen. Just don't put it. It's also equity-unbound. 
Yeah, maybe someone put an underscore or something. So if they, or if they just put all and, one word, and and actually, put home, that's not going to work. Actually, all the videos are also on the Virtually Connecting YouTube channel, which I posted here. But if the people are watching on YouTube, they won't find that playlist either. So uh, if someone could just take it and put it on YouTube for people who are watching on YouTube, that would help. I'm sure our colleagues uh, from Secretariat will help with that. Um, until we get some more questions from participants, I have a question for you. Um, so we saw that the challenges we are facing uh, are the same uh, all over the world. So we have here a very international uh, uh, group of panelists from uh, uh, a lot of continents, and we, we are facing the same challenges. Uh, I'm asking as a teacher, maybe a, a hands-on question. How can I best find the, the group where to, where to fit in, uh, in your platforms? Can I get a more localized uh, group to, to talk with uh, from my area? That's a good question. Um, so, one of the things we're thinking about with the new project with the Socially Just Academia is that we want to provide a forum for people to come and think about what they want to do locally. But what they probably want to do locally is they come to us to get ideas for how to do things, and then go back locally and find people locally to do it, because not everyone locally will want to be joining those online spaces. Uh, this is one of the tricky things, is that if you want people locally, you don't usually go online to find them. You, you find local spaces, even local online um, mailing lists or things like that to be able to find them. So this is what I would say. You might sometimes, of course, bump into someone a local in an online space, and it does happen sometimes. But um, I, th I would say for the most part, come and learn about how to build these learning communities and then take that learning and apply it locally. And I would say, uh, and, and that can sometimes be lots of local spaces also interconnecting later. That's my first thought on that. I can uh, mention another project that I'm involved with um, uh, that we call DigPins. And it's digital. It's an acronym. It's kind of like a short. It's kind of like an abbreviation and an acronym put together. So the DIG is an abbreviation for digital. And then PINS is an acronym for Pedagogy Identity Networks and Scholarship. And what we do there is we encourage people to make small um, local communities at their schools. So Meha has run a cohort. I've seen Joe Murphy in the uh, chat there. He ran a cohort at Kenyon College. Um, but we all come together at the same time. We run sort of the same readings and the same activities at the same time. And each group has their own local space as well um, as a larger space where we can all come together. And I, I don't like to make things digitally specific or technologically specific, um, but I'll say we use synchronous chat environments. So you know, something close to like an IRC chat, uh, Slack, Microsoft Teams, something like that, right? So that way you have a way to quickly kind of message each other, but also have longer form, um, uh, longer form ways of uh, processing some of the things that we're talking about, you know, or the things that we're reading, the conversations that we have through blogging, for instance. And so um, I think there is a rich, uh, uh, there's rich soil there in terms of creating local cohorts that then work together to have a larger conversation with a community of cohorts. Um, it's not perfect. Community is always kind of messy, right? But um, I do, I, I'm very passionate about that. And I think that there is real, um, I think that there's real potential there. But I think it starts through uh, having, and this goes back, I think, a little bit to virtually connecting. So a big thing that made virtually connecting work is that we had an on-site coordinator who we called an on-site buddy and a, um, uh, a virtual coordinator that we called the virtual buddy. And each of these folks kind of work together. Well, the same thing with DigPins. Um, all of the local coordinators who are running cohorts at their schools, we kind of have our own little sub community where we're talking to one another as well. So I really think it comes down to a bit of a layering of um, 
you know, different coordinators, people who are really paying attention to that hospitality piece, making sure that people feel heard, making sure that people's voices are being recognized. And um, because one person can't do it all, right? And so having um, at least two people who can be in communication with one another um, to help organize and pay attention to hospitality, I think is key. Thank you for that answer. Um, I uh, see that we have uh, also a question in the Q&A, but before you have a, a, a chance to read it, um, I want to ask you another um, question. Uh, we know that many people are uh, attending webinars, but they are afraid to join communities. And we talked a lot about uh, equity. Uh, People are afraid that maybe they don't speak a uh, very good uh, foreign language. Uh, they are afraid they don't know anyone. They are afraid maybe they don't have the uh, necessary digital skills. How can you encourage these people, these teachers to join uh, uh, these communities, no matter the, the lack of skills, the lack of uh, uh, language, the ba barrier of language and so forth and so on. First of all, you're also describing some structural issues. So there are valid concerns, right? So one, some of the things we're doing, we did with virtually connecting, especially at first, um, is that, for example, there's a lot of people, we say participate in whatever way you feel comfortable. So at first people were watching on YouTube and then they would join. But if you join, you're not forced to turn your camera on. You're not forced to speak if you don't have to want to. If you want to type your question, sometimes people who's not, it's not their first language, it's easier for them to type it because it gives them more time to think. So they can do that. And then the facilitator reads it out loud to make sure that other people notice it. Um, and so the, the spaces themselves have to allow for this diversity of participation so that not everyone has to participate fully in order to be part of the community. So I can understand if someone can't find a space that is welcoming in that way. Um, the, the other thing is it really helps if there's someone who can mentor you through and help you get into a space. So if you know one person who is very active online, that person can help you through it. So for example, you know, if I tell people, oh, you can find good things on Twitter, then I, as a mentor, what I do is I, if they have a question, I tag them on Twitter and tell them, here are some people who can help you and ask that person to help introduce you to others. It is very difficult to go to a space. Face to face, it's really embarrassing to go up to someone you don't know or go into a crowd. And no matter how friendly they are, it would look like a click that, you can't enter. That's, I think that's a valid concern to have. So if you find one person in your community or someone that you do know who can help you through it, I think that is really, really important. Um, and and um, yeah, and the question about the environment in your work not supporting you, you feel isolated. For me, it's, it's joining the online spaces. Uh, this is what keeps me going, to be honest, because you can find people who are as specialized in the thing that you are with your same interests, and then you bring that back to your work and show them, oh, look what I've been learning, you know? And it's very difficult, especially for people whose work it is to support other people. They're usually the one or two people in their whole you know, university sometimes doing that. Work. Go ahead, Mia. Yeah, no, I just wanted to echo what you're saying and just add a little of my own experience there. Some of the time I feel like institutional, um, uh, the context for our institutional work is, is sort of um, more constrained than the kinds of things we feel we can accomplish and also in terms of time, in terms of like breadth of our work, et cetera. It's, it's different when we look outside and look openly. Um, that has been a certain engine in, in all honesty in my own career um, is that when I feel frustrated in a particular local situation, then I just make sure I keep continuing to grow and and do and listen and participate in context outside. And then I bring it back in. So as an example, um, Sandra, I think it, it, you might have asked this question or you were asking it for someone else, but whomever to whomever um, asked this question, one of the things that I'm doing now in terms of our new launch project of imagining a socially just academia, um, is that I've been asked to chair the, the diversity, inclusion, and equity um, uh, work within my university. So that's a big job, right? But there's all kinds of local politics involved. But I'm sort of leveraging my listening, my design, my interest, my collaboration with the outside network in order to think of the best way 
to take what's needed in my local context and make it move further. And it's not always a good, it's not always an equal match. There's sort of a kind of translation issue a little bit and you have to sort of see what's on the ground and what you can move along on the ground versus what you can do in open spaces that's, that are different. But I think it's a really good question that's being asked. You know, how do we do this work um, both in our immediate um, communities, but then all, also in a broader sense. And um, it's, it's actually like a, an issue of calibration a little bit, um, but I do um, leverage one for the other and vice versa in order to understand things better and to get more done. Thank you ladies for these answers. We have uh, uh, one question in the Q&A from uh, Catherine Cronin. And she's asking if you can say a bit about the mutual support and strength that this work can provide as a community network of educators, because many educators are feeling overwhelmed right now. And I, I can totally agree with this. So yeah. if you can please. Uh, okay, I'm going to have one. to leave. Speaking of being overwhelmed, I have to leave in two minutes because <laughs> I have something else that I have to attend. Um, I think there are spaces that you go to that help promote your well being, and there are spaces you go to that make you more tense. Uh, if any of these things in this traumatic time make you feel tense, then that's not the right space for you. And even if a lot of other people are enjoying it or like it or find it welcome, if it doesn't feel welcoming to you, I wouldn't force myself to do it. Like try it once or twice. Ask a friend who enjoys it to take you with them. Ask friends for recommendations for spaces. Um, and also, uh, you know, find spaces where you can take something and adapt it rather than have to do a lot of work when you're overwhelmed. And I'll leave it to Ottoman and, and Mia to continue this because I have to. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maha, for being with us today. And uh, let's see if uh, Mia or Ottoman want to uh, give an answer. Yeah. Mia, we cannot hear you. Yeah, oh. we hear you. Okay. Um, I, I'll just weigh in a little bit more on that and say, um, when we founded Equity Unbound some two or three years ago, we thought that it was about expanding our work um, for our students. In many ways, we were um, interested in kind of growing a community and thinking about the ways in which our students can become sort of digitally literate, um, globally networked learners. That's what we were thinking of as our first set out the gate. But what actually ended up happening is that these this network became our solace. It became our our place to um, you know work through uh, things that were stressful. Um, so in a way, it also became a very um, enriching professional development space, and that was a bit um, unforeseen. So it, 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 we actually um, wrote about this, a team of Equity Unbound educators wrote about this um, recently about well-being and self-care and um, the need for um, uh, spaces where we can be heard and listened to in ways that are enriching that we can also then bring back in some way. Um, so it's a surprising thing to, um, I guess said more simply, um, we find friendships anew in some of these networks and spaces that give us the strength to keep going with the work that we know um, is important, et cetera. So um, I guess it's all about that idea of well-being, just as Maha said, and, and um, navigating that thoughtfully um, and being in spaces that support you for real and not just drain you. Thank you, Mia. I think we have time for one more question, which uh, Autumn received. She already answered. So the question is, if you have any experience of using the uh, techniques for making people feel welcome with people who are a little bit more resistant. Please, Autumn. Yeah, so um, the thing to remember as well is that uh, not everybody is joining these spaces of their own volition, right? Sometimes people are forced to be part of a community. Um, it, with our students, we see this all the time with required classes. Um, so if you've ever taught a class where students, like an introductory class, that's a requirement for students, it's, it can be very painful. But even in our um, community, creating communities of uh, professional development for faculty, you know, sometimes they're told that they have to come into these spaces. And that can be very, uh, 
that can be a very problematic space. Again, um, I don't think that you can force anyone to feel welcome. It just defeats the purpose of it. You will feel welcome now. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? Um, but yes, I think that um, trying to uh, get those folks on board with that bigger picture. So why is this course a requirement? Why is this professional development um, experience a requirement? Um, and, and if you can get them on board with that, you can lessen that to some degree. Um, outside of that, I think it's really just empathizing with them about the fact, like, yes, I know it's a requirement. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want it to be a requirement either. But, you know, while we're here together as a community in this space, how can we make this the best experience that we absolutely can for everybody involved. Um, I think that's another uh, technique that can be used to maybe make those spaces a little bit more hospi hospitable. Um, and uh, I'd also say I'd, I personally try to advocate to, to lessen those kind of experiences, <clears throat> especially when it comes to faculty development. I would rather give a large breadth of different options, um, have several different types of communities with different focuses. I, um, I partner with faculty. So later today, I'm actually going to be part of a, uh, a faculty learning community that's called Teaching with Tablets, where folks who teach with tablets who have iPads and um, uh, Android tablets, those kind of things, and who teach with them get together and just have social hour and have conversation about that. We have another one called DigPed at Dearborn, which is headed up by another faculty member. So try to find those faculty who are passionate about those things and let them um, kind of be the focal point for those communities. Um, I've had success with that, and uh, I can't guarantee that it would be successful in all uh, environments, but I think that that can be helpful too. Thank you, Autumn, for this great answer. Um, we have one more question in the Q&A actually uh, from Siska. Is there anywhere an overview of this fantastic community platform so that teachers can easily find the one they fall in love with? I'm guessing uh, other community platforms rather than the links we already uh, shared in, via the chat. Um, if one of you two can answer this one. If you go to the Equity Unbound um, website, then you, in there you will find a link to the 1HE Community um, uh, Building Resources. You'll also find a link to the Imagining a Socially Just Academia um, uh, uh, community. It's all sort of umbrellaed there. Um, except for virtually connecting, which um, is also inherently involved with with all of this, but um, I think there's less of an access point there. So, but if you just type in virtually connecting, you'll find that as well. Um, Catherine, thank you for putting um, the link to Equity Inbound in the chat. So that one you can get to global, the 1HE, 1HE Global um, Community Building Resources and this um, Imagining of Socially Just Academia and also just um, curricular activities that are happening in here and now um, this semester uh, in a, you know, that are open and, you know, they might be of interest to you. The virtually connecting is also now in the chat and that is um, some, the network is very connected. It's not featured in Equity Unbound, but probably should be. And it's something for us to actually um, think about. And thank you, Autumn, also for including DigPins, which is a, another wonderful resource. So at least it's all there at the bottom of the chat. <laughs> Thanks well, and for the I'll question, just, Jessica. Please, Autumn. I'll just really quickly add that, um, you know, this these these kind of uh, connected communities pop up all over the place, it seems like. And I, I actually don't know of a good hub for them. Um, outside of the things that we've mentioned today, they, it just seems like there are things that are happening all the time. Um, I think being active in social media spaces like Twitter is a big one for me. I met a lot of folks through Twitter, um, paying attention to some of the organic 
um, MOOCs that pop up, not those uh, Coursera MOOCs. I mean, those are great too, but I'm thinking about more like the CL MOOC that Mia was a part of. Um, and those kind of things can be a great way to make connections. And I really find that these things just kind of organically grow and pop up through um, through mutual friendships that are built that we talked about earlier. Thank you for those very good out inputs. Uh, before we close this session, I want to ask you one final question for the both of you. So if you could now, uh, in these times, after all this discussion about the communities, offer one piece of advice, only one piece of advice for all the teachers that are uh, listening to us right now, uh, what would that advice be? Whichever of you wants to, to start. <laughs> you are not coming through, Mia. There we go. <laughs> okay, now it's working. Um, hmm, that's a really hard question. I guess the first thing that came to mind was remember the power of listening. Because I think that we're so busy sometimes trying to get across things that we don't pay attention as much as we should to those who we're, we are learning with. So remember to listen to, um, and to um, you know, create an environment in which listen, active listening is something that you're modeling and that, um, and sometimes listening means, you know, making sure they know that you really read what they wrote, um, making sure that you pause and you think about things um, before you cut something off and move ahead with content. That's what I thought of first. There's so many things, but that's the first thing I thought of. Really Thank hard. You, that is a really hard question. <laughs> yes, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with um, be mindful and creative in your uses of technology. Don't be afraid of it. You're not going to break it. Even if you do, that's fine. Um, that can be very, even if you do break it, that can be very enlightening as well. Um, but don't just stick to the basics. Think about how you can use it in creative ways. Think about ways that you can use it that are maybe a little bit unconventional. Um, and be gentle with yourself and with your students. Thank you, ladies. Those were very good uh, pieces of advice. Um, I, I, would, I will risk and also offer one piece of advice for myself. Uh, I remind you that today is uh, Teachers International Day, and I was saying that we can all have, we all have the potential of being the leader. We have the potential of leading our community. So that's my advice. Be a leader for your community in, uh, in these uh, challenging times. Thanks. I want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar, especially for uh, our three wonderful uh, speakers who uh, offered us our, uh, their very uh, warm uh, opinions about the uh, teacher community communities for teachers. Um, and uh, I would like to remind you that next week we are going to have a webinar, an Eden webinar uh, about the research workshop, uh, which is going to happen uh, from the 21st to the 23rd of October. And the registration is still open until next Monday, so feel free to, to register. Um, I hope I'm going to see you at the next uh, webinars of uh, Eden. Uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you, participants, and have a very nice day. <laughs>